Well, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this great saint, Saint Charbel. A lot of you probably have never heard about this monk, saint from the Middle East, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about him today. Um, he is one of the saints who is a miracle worker, and I'm going to share with you a couple miracles. We'll talk a little bit about his life, um, but first I want to do a little introduction to tell you why I love this Saint Charbel so much and how we've grown to a deeper devotion to Jesus and Mary through his intercession. So my mom is Lebanese, my dad is Croatian, we're, my grandparents were from Lebanon, which is the country that St. Charbel's from. And when I was probably in grade school, my grandmother had a very, very good friend who was related to St. Charbel in Lebanon. And at the time, we would get a lot of the prayers and a lot of the petitions and praying for him to become canonized. He was canonized in 1977. So one day, you know, in our house, we had all kinds of pictures and relics and all kinds of things. So one day, my grandfather, who had very severe migraine headaches, do you ever have a headache? Sometimes you feel like your head is going to explode, right? And it went on for days. And he had these headaches for probably 15, 20 years. And it was so bad one day that, and I remember this vividly, that he took the, this little prayer card with a relic in it of St. Charbel, and he asked God to heal him. He prayed and he begged out to St. Charbel to please pray for his headache to go away because it was so bad. That was the last headache that he ever had. And I remember, and as I began in my own faith journey, that's where I, it, it helped me to go deeper in my faith. So I want to tell you that's where this talk is coming from. I'm going to talk to you from my heart. I don't have notes. We're going to talk about whatever it is the Holy Spirit wants you to hear today is what we're going to say, okay? So St. Charbel, pray for us. St. Charbel was born in 1828, died in 1898. He was 70 years old. And as a boy, his name was Joseph. Anybody here have the name Joseph? Beautiful. So, so now you have a connection to this to this saint. St. Charbel's name was Joseph Makhlouf. And when he was three years old, his father died. And so he was raised by his mom, and he had two uncles who were monks. And so as a little boy, he began a deep prayer life where he would go into like this little cave area in the village that he lived in, and he would pray to God, asking Jesus to help him. He began a devotion to our Blessed Mother. And a lot of times his friends would make fun of him, right? Because he was so holy, even at a young age, even at your age, as he began growing. And so I'm going to show you a picture of the cave. If, you, if anybody ever goes and visits his hometown, you can see where this great saint was as a little boy. But I'm going to share with you a story. When when he was there, this is one of the stories that were passed down, there were, there were kids that were playing on the hillside in the, in the village, and there were some wild dogs that were chasing them. And remember I told you, St. Charbel, little Joseph, was always in this area praying to God, to the Blessed Mother, to help him, right? To get closer to Jesus, to grow a deeper love for the Eucharist and for the Blessed Mother. So the kids were so frightened that they didn't know what to do. They thought they would come and run to little Joseph, St. Charbel, to help him. And so they, they did. And when he, he got up, he said, you know, what's wrong? He said, the dogs are chasing us. And what did little Joseph do? He went out and the dogs were coming and he said, stop, you don't belong here. And the dog's tail went down and walked away. So as he started to grow, there were many things that started to happen that showed us that God showed and gifted him with, with a very special gift of the Holy Spirit of healing and help and connection. So let me show you what that little cave looked like. So this is, this is kind of what it looks like. And what he used to do is he got a little statue of the Blessed Mother, and in the Maronite church, the Maronite rite, which is we have the Roman and the Byzantine and all the different rites under the one holy Catholic church. 
he would get a little bit of incense and bring it in there and he would develop his own prayer space. It was his sacred space. And this is kind of what it looked like. So I just wanted to show you that picture. So St. Charmble, at the age of 23, he, he couldn't really stand it any longer. The world was not the place where he wanted to be. He wanted to be completely devoted in prayer to God. And so he became a monk. He joined the monastery. And then he became a priest. And finally, he went even deeper into what we call a hermit. And so his entire life was devoted to Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. So as he, in the monastery, he would spend hours, and after he became a priest, he would celebrate Mass every single day. He would spend hours preparing for the Holy Eucharist. Just asking God to prepare him, to connect him, to be open to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So he believed that in the host, that Jesus was truly present there. How many of you believe that Jesus is truly present in the Holy Eucharist? Absolutely. That's why we are who we are as Catholics. And so St. Charbel's life was dedicated to Jesus in the Eucharist. And then after he celebrated Mass, he would spend hours thanking God for giving us the substance, the sustenance, the, the food that, that heals our soul which is Jesus in the Eucharist. And so that's who St. Charbel was. Nobody knew him. He didn't write diaries. He didn't write any books. But what we do have is his dedication to God and our Blessed Mother. And through that, God has found him favorable in gifting him with the gift of miracles. He's a miracle worker. In fact, in our church, he has more miracles than anybody else in the history of our Catholic Church. Did you know that? So that's something that I want you to remember today. If somebody says, well, you know, what did you learn about St. Charbel? Well, that's one of the facts. Over 30,000 miracles attributed to this saint. I want to give you one interesting miracle when he was alive, and then I'm going to talk to you about a couple miracles that, that we had an experience with that I want to share personally with you. So if you can see in this picture, there's a lamp here. Now remember, I said that St. Charbel lived in the 1800s. And so we didn't have, you know, kind of like turning on the lights. He lived in a very, like in a monastery hermit where, hermitage where there wasn't like lights that you just turn on. He would read the Bible and he would study through the light that came from the oil lamp. Okay? So one day... The oil ran out, so he asked a couple of his brother monks to fill it with oil. Well, even at that time, the brother monks would kind of make a little bit of fun of him because he was so holy. In a joking way, in a loving way, right? He was their brother in Christ. So what did they do? They put water in his lamp. And they kind of watched, and they wanted to just play a joke on him. Well, when he went to light the lamp, guess what? What do you think happened? It turned on. It lit. And when the superior of the monastery saw that, he was amazed. And it confirmed to him that, yes, in fact, this priest, monk, Charbel, Father Charbel, was really somebody that God had chosen to be a, one of his saints. And so it lit that when they took it, they, the, the superior came and tasted the, the water to make sure, and it was truly, in fact, water, and it lit. So that's one of many, many miracles. In fact, the superior, the head of the monastery, uh, sister, was dying. And we know the story that came and what they did was they asked Father Charbel to go to pray at the bedside when he was just a priest. And he went, he prayed. Guess what? She got better. And they asked him, you know, what did you do? He said, I prayed. That's all I did was pray. He had a very great devotion in prayer. 
And it's not anything that you and I don't have access to. We have access to praying, to being closer to God in meditation, in reading the Holy Scripture. And which is the ultimate? What's the ultimate prayer that we can enter into every Sunday we go? Anybody know? Mass. Mass. The holy, the celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass. And the more we do that, the more we get fed, the more stronger we get on the inside. Okay? That's who St. Charbel was. That's what he taught. That's what his life teaches us. Okay? So on Christmas Eve, I want to tell you what happened when St. Charbel died. So he was a priest. Remember I said that he celebrated the Eucharist every single day? Well, one day, it would have been eight days before Christmas Eve. Okay, so that would have been December, what, 17th, 1898. Okay, he was celebrating Mass, and as he was elevating the host, he collapsed. He collapsed, and, you know, they took the host out of his hand, and they helped him to his cell, back to where he, where he stayed and slept. There was a prayer that St. Charbel was saying during the Mass, and it's called the Father of Truth Prayer. This prayer is a powerful prayer, asking God, Father of Truth, behold your Son, a sacrifice pleasing to you. In other words, it's a prayer that offers the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father. Isn't that what we do during Mass? Yeah, right? So he continued to pray that prayer for seven days, actually eight days, and then he died on Christmas Eve in 1898. The night that he died, they moved his body from his cell into the chapel, very small, humble chapel. It was freezing cold. It was snowing in the mountains of Lebanon, right? And what happened... There was one hermit in the, in the chapel. There was a bright light that started coming from the tabernacle and shone upon St. Charbel's face. That was a huge deal because what that did was that kind of confirmed in the minds of his superiors and the monks and the hermits that he, in fact, was somebody that was very, very holy in his life. And what made him holy? So I'm going to continue that little story, but I want to ask you, if, if, if we were just to stop and I were to ask you, what do you think he did in his life that made him so holy? He prayed. He prayed. And he attended Mass, which is the highest prayer. And that's exactly what he did. And out of that, God connected and you know, made him a great saint. So when that light shone there, it was a confirmation that he, in fact, was somebody that was very, very holy. They buried him a very humble barrier, burial in a, in a little casket. Within 40 days, a light began shining from his tomb. And the people in the whole surrounding area was able to witness and started coming to the place where it was a very desolated very humble little village, and people started flocking there. And guess what happened? The sick people started coming. What do you think happened to the people that came asking God and asking St. Charbel to pray for them? What do you think happened? Um, they They got healed. And there are many, many healings and miracles that started happening. And as time went on in our church, people began flocking to that area. And so even today, there are many, many miracles that happen. I want to refer to this word, incorrupt. Does anybody know what that word means? Exactly. That's exactly right. Your body, even after you know, somebody passes, their body still stays warm and looks like they're just sleeping. And so St. Charbel is one of those saints whose body is incorrupt, meaning that 
after 45 days, remember I told you that light started coming out? Well, they didn't know what was happening, so they opened up the casket and they found that his body was sweating. There was water and kind of oil substance, a little bit of just the, the body was perspiring. And that doesn't happen to everybody. But in this case, they would take and and remember I told you my grandmother's best friend is related? Well, at that time, even before he became a saint, they would take pieces of cotton and pieces of cloth that became relics because it was saturated with this beautiful fragrance of the oil and perspiration that was coming from his body. And people on the spot were healed. Now, I'm a medical doctor. I practice medicine. And the hospital is, is where my patients are. And, you know, we're trained as a medical doctor to have a scientific approach, right? We know all about science. And, but I want to make sure that you understand that science and our faith come together. That it's so important to, to be open and to understand that there are some limitations that we as medical doctors can do. And so we have to be open to God's power because he's the ultimate physician. Yes? Amen? Amen. Absolutely. Amen. So today, I want to leave you with this special devotion that we're going to start, and I'm going to teach you this little prayer to St. Charbel because he brings us closer to Jesus and Mary. Okay, so St. Charbel, you're not going to see many different pictures of St. Charbel. There's really one image, and there are little variations, but nobody ever took a picture of him. He was a monk, and he was a hermit, meaning that he was never allowed to go back out into the world. His life was completely in a secluded way, constantly in prayer and communication to God. That's, that was his life. So how do we know what he looked like? Well, in 1950, there were five seminarians from the United States that went to his village, to where his tomb is, to the monastery, and somebody snapped a picture. They took a photo, and on that photo, in front of his hermitage, there were the five young seminarians, but there was one more person that appeared in the picture. Who do you think it was? Charbel, that's right, St. Charbel. That's the image that came up. And that's how we know that that's um, what he looked like, kind of in an, in an image. So it's considered a miraculous image. Okay. So as we said, there are over 30,000 miracles attributed to St. Charbel. There's two that I want to tell you about today. Okay, the first one happened here in Arizona. In 2016, just a few years ago, there was a blind girl, and I'm going to show you a picture, who came to visit the relics of St. Charbel. Does anybody, some of the older guys, I want you to tell me, what is a relic? Anybody know? Yes. It's something that came from a saint. Yes, something that came from a saint. You had your hand up as well. Relic. Uh, yeah, it's something uh, that touched the saint. Or That's right. There are different classes. So, the first relic is maybe a part of the saint's body, bone, you know, sometimes the, the tongue of St. Anthony. We know today's the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. The, you know, different parts of their, of their body that, that, are, that we revere because the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, God has given us these gifts to have. It's called a first-class relic. A second-class relic is something that touched the body. And then a third class is something that touched something that is a relic. So um, St. Charbel's first class relic, actually his bone and some of his blood, came to the United States and visited us at St. Joseph's Maronite Catholic Church here in Phoenix. Let me tell you the story. She was 31 years old, and she couldn't see. She was completely blind. She walked in with a white cane, and she prayed in front of the, the relic. I brought a relic here today, by the way. This is a second-class relic that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but 
she begged God to heal her. Now let's make sure that we all understand it's God who heals through the intercession of the saint. The saint is prays just like you and me pray. Okay? And so, you know, we say we pray to the saint, but in effect, it's God who does the healing. It's just that, you know, the saint is such a close friend of Jesus that a lot of times Jesus doesn't say no. Um, so Daphne came and begged God to heal her, got a blessing, received the Eucharist, went to confession first. Confession is absolutely vital. It's like taking a bath. It's like cleansing ourselves so that God can do the work that he wants to do. Does that make sense? Everybody agree with that? Okay. The holy oil that came from St. Charbel's tomb, remember I told you that? And on the spot, people were healed. She was blessed with the oil on her eyes. She went home, went to sleep. In the middle of the night, she woke up with severe pain in her eyes. That's a picture of me looking at her eye. Because after that night, she, she kind of was able to see little shadows. Not complete yet, but she knew something happened. So she called her eye doctor, and she went in, and within two days, they brought her back. They did a complete exam of her eye. We have the pictures before and after to show. Her vision came back perfect. 2020 vision, doesn't wear glasses, was on a whole lot of medicine, is off of all the medicine, and she called the priest at the church and said something happened, and so he contacted me as a medical doctor, and we put a whole group of doctors together, and we got all of the records, and we really investigated it to make sure that this was, in fact, the truth, and it, in fact, is the truth. There was no explanation for what happened. Her vision came back complete. And so through the power, through the intercession of St. Charbel, which is one of many, 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 many miracles, this is one now that is documented in Anaya at his tomb in, in Lebanon. So it's a beautiful thing that happened right here in Arizona. Does anybody have any questions about that before we move on? I just want to kind of get, get you guys talking. Yes? I have a question. Yes. Was she born blind or what was the reason for her blindness? Great question. No, she had been blind for four years. She had a condition called intracranial hypertension. And what that is, another word is pseudotumor cerebri, which is where the pressure in the brain is very, very high. And the pressure kind of strangulates the optic nerve. And the optic nerve died. And she lost her vision four years prior to this. Now, in the meantime, she had, they had done everything to lower that pressure. They siphoned off the fluid, the you know, spinal fluid and all of that. Nothing worked. So that was, her, that was her condition. And now it's completely, completely normal. That's the story of the blind woman here in Arizona. On the 18th of every month, this happened January 18th, 2016. So on the 18th, the priest has a special healing mass, thanking God, for the gift of this miraculous healing. And so every month, on the 18th of the month, we have a special healing mass with the blessing with the holy oil, and it's beautiful. And you're all welcome to come at any time. So that's a, that's a beautiful thing that we have access to. Let me share with you another story. Now I'm going to share with you something that is personal, that um, I don't talk a whole lot about, but whenever I give these talks, I think it's, it's a beautiful testimony to God's healing power. So a friend of mine's daughter had a baby, baby Lena. And the baby was born with a paralyzed vocal cord. Does anybody know what happens? If, you, if your vocal cord doesn't work, what happens? You can't talk or like use, make any sound. That's right, you can't talk. But more than that, you can't swallow because, if it, because the vocal cord protects the airway because if you, eat, if you put food or water down there and it doesn't protect it, it'll go into the lung. It's called aspiration, okay? It's for you older guys. So, so 
it's very, very dangerous when the vocal cord doesn't work because there's a risk of pneumonia and putting the, the fluid in the food that we feed the baby with. It'll go right into the lung, okay? So you see this little tube here? That tube was there to protect her and it was an emergency. And I was, when I heard about it, it really, really affected me. I started praying constantly to God, asking St. Charbel to heal this baby because I had just arrived from a trip to Lebanon visiting St. Charbel and I brought his oil back. I took my mom there and it was a beautiful trip. So I went to visit my friend in Pittsburgh like that weekend and I brought the oil with me. And I went to the, to the hospital and I brought the holy oil on a little Q-tip. And the baby was in her mother's arms and, you know, we just said a little prayer. And I said to her mom, I just want to bring the holy oil and, you know, put a blessing on the baby, asking God to heal her. So we did that. And when I did that, the baby choked three times. It was, I can remember it as if it were happening right now. The baby choked in a, in a big way. It was kind of like a, what we call a striderous cough and the baby choked, and it kind of startled me. And then I didn't think anything of it, the mom was fine, and then I left. Then, I get this text from my friend, so I want to thank you again for stopping by last night, for bringing the holy oil, it meant so much, this was what, you know, what her mom was saying, um, to pray with Lena, and honestly we feel such a comfort, thank you for the prayers. Okay. Beautiful. So next, two days later, Lena is going home today. That next day, they took the tube out because the baby, you know, didn't cough anymore. They did a test to put the, the barium and was able to see that now things were moving a little bit better. And she said, I truly believe in my heart that because of the prayers of St. Charbel and the holy oil, ever since that day, we put the oil on her. She's been progressing and so they're very thankful. And Re Lena is now doing great. She's eating. And, um, and then I, in the meantime, I asked her, I texted and I said, do you remember those three coughs? And so this is the response. She didn't respond immediately with that. I'm sorry I didn't respond to your earlier message. I do remember her having three Strider coughs. It's amazing, such a miracle. My mom and I talk about it all the time. Let me show you. And this is the baby. This is, this is <laughs> Lena. She's eating ice cream. Isn't that awesome? And so the message, I think, that what, what I want to kind of share with you is there's a parable, and I don't know if you know, it's out of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is in a room and it's crowded. And the people want so much to get close to Jesus because they have so much faith in him but they couldn't get through the door. So does anybody know what they did? How did they get in? Yeah. Through the roof. Through the roof. That's exactly right. It's through the roof. So what did they do? They carried the paralytic, and they went up through the roof, and they brought him down and put him right in front of Jesus, and he was healed. And what did Jesus say to, the, to his friends? Does anybody know what Jesus said to his friends? Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved him. So the message that I think is very, very important is that your prayers have the power through God's intercession to help each other. We have the ability to help each other. It's called intercessory prayer. And that's exactly what I believe happened here. We pray. We ask St. Charbel to pray. God hears our prayers, be persistent, and he will never, ever let us down according to his will and his time, okay? Do you see how important that is? The scripture, it's a perfect example. Everything in the Bible, in the scriptures, teach us how to live our life and confirm what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to act and how much faith we're supposed to have and pray for each other. And God hears our prayers. Jesus said, ask and you will seek, knock, 
Absolutely, and that's what we're called to do. And so talking about St. Charbon or St. Francis of Assisi, whose feast is today, or St. Therese, the little flower, or St. Padre Pio, or any of the saints, they all have the same basic foundation, which is trusting in God, surrendering to his will, praying the scriptures, and you know, letting go and letting God do what he, what he wants to do with our life. So that's awesome. That's exactly right. Okay. The father of truth prayer. We're going to wrap up. Are we okay for time? Okay. Remember I told you about the father of truth prayer? That was the prayer that St. Charbel was praying when he collapsed. So it's part of the chaplet. There's a beautiful chaplet that we pray. St. Charbel's intercession, and we ask him to carry our prayers to heaven like incense that rises up, right? So this Father of Truth prayer, I want to I pray it, I want to say it. You probably can't see it, but if you can, I'd like you to pray it with me, okay? So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father of Truth, behold your Son, a sacrifice pleasing to you. Accept this offering of him who died for me. Behold his blood shed on Golgotha for my salvation. It pleads for me. For his sake, accept my offering. Many are my sins, but greater is your mercy. When placed on a scale, your mercy prevails over the weight of the mountains known only to you. Consider the sin and consider the atonement. The atonement is greater and exceeds the sin. For your beloved son sustained the nail and the lance because of my sins. So in his suffering, you are satisfied and we live. Amen. Very good. Okay, so I just wanted you to kind of hear the content of what that beautiful prayer prayer was. So before we close, I want to share with you this relic. Now, we said there are different types of relics. First-class relic is the body of a saint. This is a piece of cloth that St. Charbel's body was placed on, um, and it touched the oil and the the perspiration that came from his his body. And so it's considered a second-class relic from his monastery, from Lebanon. Um, I don't know, usually we would have an opportunity to venerate it, but I just wanted to bring it so that so that we have it. And then what I'd like to do is I want to gift your school a special picture of St. Charbel. Okay, so this is for, I'm going to give this to you. Um, and again, it's a, my brother is an artist and he painted this picture. And so I want, to, I want to give you this. I think this is a beautiful thing to have. So I want to give you that. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Isn't that awesome? So, so when, you, when you look at that picture, now you have an idea of who he is, that he, in fact, was somebody that lived, that prayed, that prays on our behalf, right? And, um, and it's beautiful when you do that to pray a Hail Mary because St. Charbel loved our Blessed Mother. It was after his death. That's a great question to end on. Is there a reason why St. Charbel has the most miracles in the church? And I think the number one answer is it's God's will. And God found him, he found favor in how he lived his life. That he prayed constantly, he believed in the Eucharist, and his devotion was a testimony to that, and everything else God did. So it's really God who makes saints, not us. So if you want to be a saint, ask God to make you a saint, right? Because we can't do it on our own. Amen. All right. All right. His feast day is yep. Yep. His feast day is July 24th. Mm-hmm. We have people in our community, all right? We have uh, Carlos Ayala. We have Anna's brother Thomas Kota, Mrs. McMillan's mom, Kathy McMillan, 
my daughter, Abigail Etheridge, uh, the dad of a previous student here, Brandon Pulley, his dad has cancer. These are all people that we can a ask God to please heal through the intercession of St. Charbel. Okay? So, and maybe Charbel will help you pray to God for these people to get better. Maybe we'll have miracles that happen in our own school because of it, okay? One more round of applause for Ann. Before we do that, I think I want to, if we can just say one closing prayer for all of, all of the people that we just mentioned that need prayer for healing. I'm going to give you this oil from, from Anaya that we brought back. And you can see this is right from there. And there's a beautiful fragrance. Um, so this is for you. But let's just together say a special prayer asking St. Charbel to touch and heal all of those people. And your daughter's name is Abby? Abby. Okay. Um, so everybody just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to go deep, deep, deep in your heart asking God, like the four people that carried the, the man on the stretcher, we're going to beg God right now through St. Charbel and all of the saints and our Blessed Mother to hear our prayers for healing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for this time together and we just ask through the intercession of St. Charbel that you hear our prayers. Lord, infinitely holy and glorified in your saints, you have inspired Charbel, the saint monk, to lead the perfect life of a hermit. We thank you for blessing him with the strength to detach himself from the world so that the monastic virtues might triumph in his hermitage. And so at this moment, we just ask you, Lord, to hear our prayers for healing for Abby and for all of the members in our community through St. Charbel's powerful, powerful intercession we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.